I want to welcome everyone uh, to Building Better Worlds Conference. Um, my name is Mike Mitchell. Uh, I'll be serving as today's <coughs> moderator. Uh, the topic of today's panels is who will own what from personal data to digital brands. We're fortunate today to have uh, expert panelists from five different countries who will discuss this uh, very important topic. Unlike both the physical world and Web2, where, where ownership and value creation are highly centralized, Web3 offers the potential for more personal control of user identity, data, and even value creation. How will people as well as traditional corporations express themselves in this new environment? Who is going to own what in this new world? These and many other questions around personal and brand identity uh, will be discussed today. As a very brief note in my own background, I, I founded my corporate holding company in 1984 and have developed and invested in uh, planning and architectural design firms immersive digital technology companies and blockchain firms since then. And I've had the opportunity to work on the ground in 59 countries. So it's given me somewhat of a, a global perspective. Uh, our planning company's current focus is working on smart cities in, uh, in China. Uh, there we're incorporating the metaverse applications uh, like mirrored worlds uh, to study uh, city infrastructure. So we have a very knowledgeable panel with us today. Hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation. Uh, we'll begin by having each panelist introduce themselves and uh, talk about their own very interesting background. So Sarah, we'll start with you. You're on kind of top of my screen here. <laughs> Hi guys, nice to meet you all uh, virtually as it may be. My name's Sarah, I'm otherwise known as Bucks. And the reason I have a nickname is because I work for a very cool gaming company called Gala Games. Uh, we are a company that happens to build games on the blockchain, uh, giving players uh, ownership and control over their in-game assets and over the things that they enjoy, compete and spend time uh, in. So that's incredibly exciting. Uh, really looking forward to the conversation today, particularly as we as a business uh, start to branch out, taking experience as the common thread to all of the things that, that we're touching uh, on the blockchain. So thank you very much for having me. Yep, excellent Bucks. Uh, Andrea, you wanna share your background? Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I am a brick and mortar architect. I'm a traditional licensed architect who decided um, to learn programming and find ways to mix traditional architecture with software development. Um, we ended up um, building a lot of applications for AR and VR devices. And now we are running uh, extremely interesting projects of all scales that happen to be at the intersection of these two fields. So immersive technologies and, and traditional architecture space making. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, we share obviously a similar uh, background and almost a similar approach, uh, our, our firm to Andreas. Uh, Carlos, uh, uh, Wiseki is a very interesting company. and. Uh, uh, obviously, we'd love to hear about uh, you and it. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me as well to this panel. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, happy to be here and uh, to share my experience with all the people attending here. Uh, I'm Carlos Moreno. I'm a VP uh, in charge of corporate alliances and partnerships at Wiseki. Uh, Wiseki is a cybersecurity company uh, which has several verticals. And uh, um, spe those specific verticals are all uh, coming from the same foundation, everything related to identity management uh, and digital identity. It means that we, are, we do have the capability as a certification authority to issue uh, digital identity, digital certificates for people, machines, and objects. And because we came as well into the IoT world, or I would say already a few years ago. Yep. So we'll be pleased to share together with you uh, 
our expertise. Excellent, Carlos. Uh, Dennis, you want to uh, share with everyone your background? Uh, uh, hello, <clears throat> everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Dennis Maliani, CEO and founder of Apothic Assistance. We're a SaaS company that is decentralizing personal and also medical data on the blockchain uh, of Ethereum. And uh, our use cases are around uh, data security, data integrity, and interoperability that is moving data from point A to point B. Um, our current verticals are in health and also uh, managing sports data. And part of that really is empowering users to own uh, their data, manage it, share it as needed. And with that also, we are in the uh, NFT space, especially around athletes um, combining their health plus their performance statistics and creating unique NFTs they can share with their audiences and also sell to make profit. Excellent, Dennis. Sofian, uh, love to, I'm sure the panel is quite interested in uh, what you have to say, particularly your work in uh, working with international brands. Hi, nice to meet you, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here uh, and to, to learn more about what you are uh, building and, and passionate about. Uh, so I'm Sofian. I'm from Paris originally. I'm currently in Eastern Europe in, in Czech Republic. Uh, and I'm the co-founder of New Life, which is um, it's a decentralized social platform that values um, consensus on creative value, let's say. So our goal is to provide an alternative to um, attention-driven social media experiences. And we are currently on the process of rolling out our uh, layer one blockchain, which is called the NewCoin protocol, which will enable uh, apps to be built without the necessity to develop smart contracts uh, because we have uh, introduced a new architecture for blockchain where smart contracts are um, on the uh, system layer, which means that developers will be able to deploy Web3 applications uh, without having to deal with the virtual machine and all that part through a TypeScript SDK. So our goal is to, uh, to democratize uh, these kind of technologies and, and accelerate the, the deployment of uh, Web3. Excellent. Well, obviously, uh, on hearing that, uh, what we've all seen is a very um, kind of diverse and uh, expert uh, kind of perspective on, uh, on the whole point of data rights and all of that. Um, I still have a, a foot in uh, the analog world. Every morning I read a newspaper. And, and this morning's quite an interesting article. I thought perhaps we could start our, our group discussion uh, by having each of you share your thoughts about personal identity uh, and privacy rights in, in this area. Uh, the paper here, LA Times, has an article, Apple, Google, Unite Against Bill. Apple Inc. and Google warned US lawmakers yesterday that bipartisan antitrust legislation aimed at curbing the power of their companies would harm the privacy and security of their users. And they, of course, have a whole series of uh, reasons, um, including it will erect very street, steep obstacles for the company to instate new privacy controls. So obviously, uh, there's a lot of different uh, viewpoints, and and the big guys um, don't want uh, to have anything change, <laughs> and all of uh, uh, the smaller innovative companies are looking for ways uh, around that. They're of course for this bill. So anyway, I just want you to uh, kind of share your your viewpoints about privacy and identity because I think the two of them are, are intermingled in this space. And uh, so um, I want to start with you, Carlos. Give us uh, a take. Sure, with pleasure. With pleasure. <laughs> Actually, our philosophy at Wiseki as identity provider, uh, the, the identity itself is something that should be owned by the person. It means that uh, 
it's uh, it's something which is uh, uh, private. Uh, the PII, the pre uh, public, in fact, the 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 the, the, the part of the identity that uh, we are sharing with everybody uh, for a certain kind of service. It is something that is the ownership should should be from the person, not from a company like Google, like Facebook or Instagram or whoever else. Uh, the matter of fact is that from the moment that we've been already recorded, registered on those platforms, we are losing already part of the control from our identity. Uh, the, 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 I, I, can I can understand easily why those big uh, companies doesn't want to, uh, to, to share these and to uh, in fact, even share with the people that are, are representing those identities because they are making money on it and they're making, yeah. making good money on, on it. Uh, and the, the, this, this is the, the crucial issue. But uh, actually, um, the, what would be a ethic from those companies is that at least, at least they are sharing part of the revenue that they are doing on the uh, use of such identity, which is not yet the case. They are yeah, things yeah. that are on, on course, but uh, it's not yet the case. So yeah, this is my personal opinion and as well the company, opinion from the company. Uh, Sofian, you want to take a, a whack at this? <laughs> sure, yes, I think that um, we tend to associate identity to a, a layer of trust, which is provided by um, nation states. So um, we rely on the biometric passport and this kind of uh, documents to establish the, the truth about identities. Um, on the digital, in the digital space, it's a bit different because the digital space can be seen and, and they are call it the metaverse uh, can be seen as, a, uh, as an abstraction where there are some connections with the real world. So if I play on a video game, uh, I just enjoy the moment. And when I go out of the video game, all the things that happen inside the video game have no consequence in the real world. Uh, the idea of a metaverse and, and internet as a whole is that there is this connection between the real world and the digital space where I can play a game where at the end I can lose all my funds or I can uh, buy a house if I play well. And so the question becomes, how do we uh, provide the level of privacy that is required for internet to not turn into 1994? Uh, while keeping uh, the level of, of reliability and security. And so that's where blockchain has a lot of potential. Uh, for example, using encryption, using the ability to be pseudonymous, but still have a form of security as with mechanism design and, and all kinds of uh, uh, disciplines within blockchain that try to deal with, the, with those issues. Um, I'm very interested currently in zero knowledge proof. Uh, there, there is a blockchain that has been rolled out or that is currently being rolled out where they actually um, take a snap of your iris and they have like this ability to prove that it's you without actually sharing any of this data with the, with the third party because it's all on the smart contracts. And so I think there is a great potential in, in this kind of technologies. What is also interesting that has been explored uh, is uh, the idea of doing some community-based KYC where you would uh, show up on a Zoom call like the one we are having now, and you would have a quick chat with other people and they would certify that you're a real person, which would prevent uh, things like people flooding those with like tons of fake accounts to, to, to influence the votes. Uh, so there is just a creative playground at this stage where there are lots of ways to tackle that. And I think that it's just a matter of time until we are able to optimize this, this ratio yeah. between privacy and, and, um, and uh, reliability of the identity. Yeah, uh, you raised some interesting questions about uh, uh, the point of balancing these uh, issues, uh, which is, I think, a, a key central issue that everybody is wrestling with. Uh, Bucks, do you have any comments you'd like to add to this? Oh, so many comments. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I, I don't believe that the two things are intermingled or I don't believe they should be. Um, I think we're all sick to death of being the actual product and because we're not paying for it. And we've heard that for years. 
Um, and so I love the idea that your privacy and your identity can be, particularly in this, this meta world, be mutually exclusive. And we see it all the time in our, our community. We have hundreds of, you know, we've got over 100,000 people in there. And our company talk to our community every single day. They are the most important element that we have and we love them. Um, and we don't necessarily know who they are because they've created an identity online but we do get to know the person and they can build it and they can craft it and they can change it and we don't need to know where they live we don't know, need to know if they've got dogs cats children because quite frankly it's none of our business and i i love that about um the, this new world the fact that you can be anyone from anywhere and you can still have the right to participate and uh the comment that was just made around um the fact that you know these worlds are coming together and you can play a game and you can earn money that you can spend in the real world i think that's where it becomes really exciting and i do understand from a kyc point of view um, and from a you know a practical identity point of view there's some big hurdles there but essentially it's whether you you want to take the the blue pill or the red pill and whether you're happy to kind of live in this new world where you can be whomever you want to be um, and you can have access to things that, you know, it doesn't matter, as I say, quite, quite frankly, where yeah. you live. Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I yeah. quite like the idea that they're not together anymore. Well, excellent. Uh, Andrea, do you have a, do you have a take on that particular issue? <laughs> um, I'll take a shot. So for me, the biggest issue is um, that we're lacking a clear definition about identity. And this is shifting ground because as new technologies like VR and AR are coming up, um, they offer new possibilities for defining identity. So the standard definition, I guess, at the basic level is prove that it's you. I think Sofian used this statement. It's the thing that proves that it's you. Well, what is you? Is it you, the biological entity? Um, is it you, the brain that is inside that biological entity and is capable of consciousness? The thing is, the longer I spend time in VR worlds, um, the less important these things appear to both me and society and maybe corporations that might have some business to do with me. Um, also, the longer we interact with AI systems and as AI systems develop, um, again, the blurrier the line becomes between me and the biological entity, me and the brain that is here. Um, what do these companies want to know from us right now in terms of identity? They want to know the name we're born with. They want to know the gender. They want to know where we are. So where the biological entity exists. Mm -hmm. Um, well, none of those things really matter in VR. Um, and another aspect I want to bring up very quickly, in the last two years, we've seen a lot of very interesting studies coming out of neuroscience. And these studies are showing that in virtual worlds, you're, you, you start to identify with avatars, sometimes even non-humanoid avatars at a neural level. So your visual and motor cortex are making a connection to human and non-human avatars. So, and, and to the kind of affordances that those avatars might have. So we're literally living through a time where this new technology is expanding how we live life um, and how we Not think just... of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can talk about protecting data and privacy without first attempting even an insufficient, but at least common definition of who is you, who is the you that we're protecting uh, that's supposed to represent this identity that we're talking about. Well, this is what happens when you bring smart people together. We're just blowing up the whole concept of, of who we are, what we are, and where we are. Uh, Dennis, do you, do you have a, your take has been on kind of protecting uh, people's very specific identity related to their uh, healthcare information. So maybe just you could give a bit of your take and then we'll, we'll uh, move on to a broader topic. Yes, so 
our belief at Apotheca is that um, identity and privacy, they go hand in hand. So although our tech, we came from the uh, healthcare setting and the reason being is that um, healthcare is a little bit stringent in terms of privacy, that is HIPAA, GDPR. Um, also you have the California Consumer Privacy Act. So we wanted to cover those bases because uh, for us, that is the baseline really to go in any other industries that you can be in, for example, finance and everything. So we believe uh, they go hand in hand. I think the best, uh, the, the challenge we have is that even in the US, we have various laws regarding your privacy and around identity that we don't have like one law. There are various. For example, you have HIPAA that will cover, let's say, for example, healthcare. Then you have COPA that is covering just maybe children. Then you have uh, VPPA that is covering uh, video privacy. So I think until when you have a unified, let's say, law that is governing and knowing how we define, for example, what is what is your identity and how is that connected to privacy, we're going to continue having these challenges. But as a company, we're very proactive in terms that the way we're developing our technology, one, we're ensuring you have a unique ID on the blockchain as an identifier. Two, it's secure. And three, you have uh, the aspect of managing and also uh, owning your data and sharing it as you, you wish, which brings us into the web three of decentralizing and also um, uh, tokenization uh, economies. So we're really uh, in for that. Excellent. Um, obviously, some different types of perspectives. Uh, I, I want to take it uh, into um, another kind of platform looking at the metaverse and what both uh, Bucks and Andrea uh, brought up. Um, in Facebook, people seem to want to um, display their identity, very specifically uh, curate uh, who they are and they, they create a storyline around them as a very specific identity. And, and their positioning, uh, like a brand. Uh, people have, have curated themselves. Now, in the metaverse, uh, obviously this issue of digital identities, will people in fact, you think, adopt uh, different identities for different purposes? Will there be, as Andrea says, kind of a, an avatar that is them? Or will there be many avatars People play different roles and have just this very kind of expansive uh, them, <laughs> not a, not not an identity, but kind of a, a broader sense of, of themselves. I, I know this is a little philosophical, but people are already positioning themselves. We we've had a couple people reply to us as panelists only as as an avatar, uh, not not as a specific. Uh, you know, person. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Bucks, uh, go ahead. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, <laughs> the the answer is um, we will find out, won't we? Uh, <laughs> Facebook is one of those places that you say you know people are crafting and curating their identities, but it is limited. It's limited to what you want to show. It's exhausting. People, you, everybody's seen the the documentaries on it and what it's doing to our kids, what it's doing for you know, this idea of you always need self gratification, the idea of not feeling good enough, you know, and we and we tend to do that as human beings, we always compare each other, you know, to ourselves to, to one another. What's amazing about and what I see in the space that I spend all of my um, time and when I'm, I'm least immersed in the digital world, is that the and, and, and I really do want to touch on the fact that the blockchain is a trustless place. That's the whole point of it. We don't need all these protocols on the top. I am Bucks. I am a pink engineer. Uh, that is my avatar. I sit and I talk to bored apes and I talk to doodles and I talk to and these guys are so proud. And if you're lucky, you talk to somebody that owns a punk and you know that they're an OG in the space. So they completely immerse themselves in it. And people are starting to understand, you know, when, when all this was happening, uh, you know, probably two years ago when it really started to drip what I was saying to the mainstream. You know, there was almost this thing like you could right click, save the picture and put it as your avatar. That is such a faux pas now. Like you, people put the, you know, and they want to prove that they own the, the, the PFP that they're displaying. Go look at my wallet. You don't need to know who I am. I'm prancy. I'm pack. I'm ferocious. I'm AAA. I'm whatever you want me to be. 
um, in this particular space. And then that person, you're absolutely right, Michael, can then go from the art space and be an avid gamer. And we've seen that with Snoop Dogg. He came out that he was Medici and he was this massive NFT collector and nobody knew it was Snoop until he put his hand up and said, hey, it's me, I've been collecting and I love this space. So I think the, the wonderful nature of this is that yes, um, you know, and people love to talk about Ready Player One in this scenario, but it is that idea of, I can bend and shift and it's the same thing, you know, I might be a mom, I might be a sister, I might be a daughter, I might be a best friend, I might be a work colleague. I'm all of those people and I'm going to be, you know, true to myself being all those people, but I show different sides of myself. And what's lovely in the metaverse is that side might be a crazy box, it might be an ape, it might be something else and then I, I can kind of take that identity with me and it depends and it's my choice uh, whether there's one of me or whether there's three or four of me depending what game uh, sector or industry that I'm playing in so I think um, and that's why people are a little bit when you start looking at a corporation trying to own this space and trying to own one specific um, format of what you should look like and how you should curate your sunsets and your beaches that it starts to feel very old world and it's like we've actually got a chance to build something completely brand new why are we trying to put the old sort of um, formats and restraints into that that's crazy to me. And we just, we need to embrace it um, for it to work. Uh, Bucks, as we would say, give a very strong take on one view. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna expand on that, uh, Andrea, both looking at that, uh, what she said, but also this issue of identity as it relates to uh, issues of what I would call risk or security. Uh, Part of the reasons we have identities in the physical world is uh, we borrow money, uh, we raise children, we, we do things that um, have risk associated with them. And obviously, um, we are now beginning to gravitate our world into this digital space. So the same things that we have in the outside world will impact us in the digital space. So kind of add on to Bucks's comments. Go ahead. I loved, I love Bucks's um, examples. And it's so wonderful to see things always almost always first happening in the gaming world, like at least the, the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. Um, I would like to add something um, that has to do with the ideological layer of identity. I feel like this is also missing from a lot of conversations of identity and privacy. So for me, the question is, why do we have a single identity? And if you look, if you go back to 300 years, so it goes hand in hand with the development of the modern state. So the modern state was grounded in the 1700s, 1800s, and that's also when government decided, well, let's count the people and make lists of people. That's also when people were given names. People did not used to have family names. Um, that's why a lot of us have names that come from uh, the kind of stuff that we do, right? We're called Taylor or we're called uh, like the shoemaker and so on in different languages. So why did that start? Why did the modern state want to make sure that we have a fixed single identity? Well, it was conscription. Um, lots of wars happening and they needed to know how many people they could send and fight that was like that was the basis of decision should we go against France or not. Um, and tax so so there's a very strong ideological layer as to why we need fixed identities, and I think what we're seeing right now with the metaverse and all these new technologies is something that is kind of a big threat to these existing ideological purposes and formats um and it's incredibly exciting um but we are seeing pushback right so so the kind of the kind of stuff that you you started um by reading in the article so we're seeing we're seeing structures of power of the in different different kind of structural power corporate uh, governmental and so on that have incentive to hold on to these this ability to look everyone up a list and say okay you are this one thing and it's written here what your name is um and to move on into something that's way more pluralistic 
Um, so that's going to pose major issues when it comes to tracking people and identifying people and, you know, this whole this whole idea of list making. Um, and I think it's vital we have these conversations um, now and, and blockchain is absolutely in the middle of in the middle of that. So for me, that's that's the key between identity and, and blockchain. Ah, oh, fascinating. Fascinating. I love Andrea. I just have to say it. I'm sorry if I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, please interact. Don't just <laughs> go. Uh, Carlos, do you want to uh, do you want to take take another look at this? Sure. Uh, I would say here we are somehow mixing identities and attributes uh, because uh, there is thing, something which is clear is we do all, all have a uh, certificate of birth, which is the origin from the identity of a person. And uh, after, afterwards, during the life, we are going to create a lot of attributes which are connected to this identity. You are going to become, a, in fact, you will have a, a school certificates and you will have a, your, your certificates. In fact, your identity for the school, you would have a, an identity for the bank as well, for the, uh, for the health, identity as well you would have attributes as well for the health which is coming from the from the origin of this uh, birth certificate and the good thing uh, in uh, in this uh, with the, this new te technology which is not yeah, is not anymore new the blockchain technology but it's the good thing that uh, from this concept is the fact that uh, here with such a platforms we do have the capability to evolve and cre create blocks of the evolution of such identity, keeping always the origin, uh, which this one is would never change. Would you would change a, a job? You would change probably of insurance. You will. You might change even of nationality, which is as well a, an identity. But your origin, your uh, certificate of birth, this this would never change. This would never change, and it's important to know this. Yeah, Sophia. You, you look like you have some thoughts on this issue. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, I would um, agree with what Carlos just said, that um, there are different dimensions to this question. And I think we, we actually all agree we are just talking about different dimensions. So, yeah. for example, one dimension that um, I was referring to earlier is this, this concept of you know, democracy. So sometimes you want people to be able to multiply themselves when it comes to the ability to vote who should get some money you might not want that and so um, the you know the concept of the cybil attack cybil resistance and so on which is one of the core uh, features of blockchain to uh, try to use decentralized ways to avoid what's currently being handled by centralized means for example on facebook or instagram if you if you sign up to instagram and you start liking and following people, Instagram will ask their database, do I know that person? Does that person have some friends, some contacts uh, already registered? Uh, so they will try to scrape your phone contact book to see if they know you and so on. And then you will have a score of trust based on that. And the reason for that is that they kind of forced to do it. Okay, they do it for advertising, obviously, but they are also forced to do it because a lot of people would just come and create millions of accounts to try to sell some likes and bots and so on. And I think that uh, the beauty of blockchain is that we can avoid that due to some uh, core components such as the scarcity of tokens or, or, or things like that, proof of stake. There are many ways to, um, to mitigate that, that issue. Um, then if we talk about you know, identity as a, the persona, you know, persona comes from mask you know, in, in Latin, which is um, a person, you know, I'm a person to you. I'm currently wearing a mask and I wear this mask with you and the same with other categories of people in my life. Uh, I would maybe not speak the same way if I was with my mom or something like that. And so I think that having this ability on the metaverse to like play and, and wear a multiplication of masks, I think is extremely exciting and having the ability to, uh, to try different things and to grow by, you know, changing and shifting personalities and masks and so on, I think is, uh, is, is very exciting, especially in this context where we are shifting from modernity to post-modernity, this like new, let's say, sociological revolution where 
people want to have the ability to be more so we can see that already in the physical world like you know the bodybuilding the fitness the tattoos the piercings like all those things you know people want to transform their body they want to transcend the limitations of their bodies and i think that being able to do that on the metaverse is, is very exciting. It has been seen already on, on Second Life for, for quite a while. And now we are getting like a Second Life 2.0 with like all the things that were missing. And yeah, I think it's, I, I agree that it's a very exciting time. Yeah, you know, being, being the oldest member of the panel, uh, having been born at the end of World War II, uh, your, your, your term, um, this, this transition uh, towards looking at ourselves in a, an unlimited way uh, has been a major transition over the last 75 years. We keep expanding uh, what we're capable of uh, psychologically. The, the space that we inhabit uh, keeps expanding. And uh, it's, it's having watched it, uh, from a very limited way we viewed ourselves and then it began expanding in terms of how we identified in our culture and then how we identified as a person and then how we started growing into the digital space. So I, I think you're exactly, all of you, from, from my perspective and uh, not being an expert in the specific technology, uh, but watching it and experiencing it, uh, you're echoing exactly what's been being transpired the last 75 years. It's just, it's taking a kind of another expression. Uh, so Dennis, we're gonna end the kind of uh, identity issue, uh, personal identity and move into corporate identity, but any closing comments from you on the issue of personal identity, then we'll look at uh, kind of this issue of brands and corporations. Yeah. We're, yeah. Uh, and Andrea will get you also in there. <laughs> so I, I'm going to take maybe um, a human aspect of it or psychological aspect of it. Yep. Uh, for the most part, um, when we are born, I, I don't know that you've been uh, in, in that setting whereby you see parents, they have a new kid or baby. They, there's that need of branding that baby, giving it name, identity that at times they struggle with, right? So it, it's like from birth, we have to be identified. It's, I think, a comfort level or psychological thing that if somebody doesn't have an identity, we won't feel maybe comfortable around them or we won't we'll feel something is missing. So that has to be settled as a baseline, getting a name, being identified, connected to a family. Then as uh, Sofain mentioned, and even uh, Carlos, then attributes start uh, coming into play as you grow and evolve as a person. Uh, that's why you see celebrities at times they changed and have they, they can change early names and have aliases because they want to define themselves based on uh, what they are doing in time or how comfortable they are. So these technologies like the metaverse uh, blockchain, I think they're giving uh, the general population now or empowering them to have that ability to really transform and really place yourself uh, or position yourself as a brand because some people are now starting to see themselves as brands and being able to you know give back to communities or do whatever you want to reach your full potential yep excellent totally agree uh, totally agree and by the way this is a, a exactly uh, the 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 current tendency it's a, a way to reappropriate our identity ourselves in order that uh, you are becoming the, the product but that you are monetizing yourself yes. not the social network exactly andrea I want to add something quickly, um, just for the sake of the conversation. I want to very respectfully but strongly disagree with something Carlos said earlier, which is that there is always an origin that never changes, end quote. Um, I would like to know more about what that origin is, because as I mentioned earlier, I can only imagine two things, your biological body 
and consciousness. Consciousness is something that we do not have any cultural scientific consensus of. We have no idea what it is or how we should define it. And there's more and more indication that it could be decentralized in interesting ways. Um, yeah. And the physical body, I know tons of people, especially young people who get into VR, who live hours and hours in their virtual body. For them, the physical body exists. Of course, we have a material substrate to everything, um, but it's not of a higher or more important place in their lives as, as, the, as the virtual body. So just the way we don't define the internet based on the fiber optic that it needs to go from house to house, um, I'm not sure we uh -huh. should define ourselves as the origin that never changes, which is this biological thing. Um, and of course, very interesting conversations we could be having about biotech. Um, that's also something uh -huh. that's coming right now. So I'm interested to hear what Carlos means by the origin that never changes. Uh -huh. The origin that never changes is uh, your certificate of birth. It means that you, you will birth just one time, usually. Well. So, <laughs> so this, this is definitely something that you cannot change. Uh, it's something that happened once and uh, it happens in one place. And uh, I, you, are, you do have a name at that moment. You do have a parent which are not going to change. And this is really the origin. After the rest, my change, definitely, definitely. But the origin, this origin, I, 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 I would have some difficulties to, to see how we can change this. Yeah. I, Andrea, I, I understand your, your <laughs> interest. And I, I think I know where you're going with this. Uh, what I would like to do, and I don't mean to cut you off, uh, is uh, to, so we don't go much over an hour and to cover some other topics. Uh, you know, we plan on doing a series of conferences. And uh, for those of you who are really interested in this topic of identity and where it's going, we certainly want to address this in much more depth because uh, I happen to agree, uh, it, is, it is changing. The very concept of who we are in, in America where we're debating the use of pronouns, I'm a they, I'm a this, I'm a that. Uh, it's, you know, uh, the, this concept of identity is, is a very large one. What, what I'd like to do, if we could, is uh, move the conversation from the individual. Uh, and I think both Carlos and Sofian were looking at this into the issue of, of um, corporate uh, positioning, corporate brand, corporate identity in uh, the metaverse. Each of you have your own uh, companies, represent them. Um, and so how um, that identity is going to be used in the, in the metaverse, in the you know, digital space, how major corporations, we saw the fashion brands jumping into the metaverse to express themselves, luxury brands. So let's spend a a little bit of time um, looking at it from their perspective. And Sofian, I know you worked with um, uh, companies um, in this space. Uh, you helped guide, I think, several luxury brands uh, in, into the metaverse. And uh, maybe you could start the conversation. Yeah, sure. So basically uh, the fashion industry is in the business of image. Uh, image is an extension of the self, so we buy um, garments, we buy other things that are fashionable. Uh, if you look at the profit margin of Hermes, for example, it's comparable to the profit margin of Apple and, um, and Ferrari. Uh, so all those products are going beyond the, the utility, uh, and they are actually some people would say useless, therefore indispensable, uh, in the sense that they, they, they get very close from, from our identity and, and what we are. And so there is a whole um, science uh, there I say about how um, people want to be perceived both individually and as part of communities. So when you buy fashion, you are communicating things to a certain group, a certain network, uh, it's a nonverbal form of communication. And so this business moving to the metaverse is a very interesting um, uh, stage, let's say. Uh, I have to say I have a bit 
um, dissociated or, or take, taken a distance from the corporate world in that regard because the disruption is so um, is so f rapid and, and, and violent and brutal that I, I don't really see this, um, let's say, layer of the ecosystem moving fast. And I'm interested in, in the part that's the most innovative. So um, I might uh, I might get back at uh, things related to, to big companies a bit later. Um, I think that the, the main challenge is that a lot of those infrastructures and, and corporations were built at a time where owning the factories and the units of production was the main uh, advantage. So in a dematerialized world, those uh, units of production are, and this whole savoir-faire, this whole you know, uh, craft that used to be their, uh, their main, um, let's say, um, uh, value add is going to be um, vaporized, let's say, uh, or at least partially, or combined. Uh, I, we can expect that you know, brands will have a life in the real world and on the metaverse. Um, and so I think that everything moving towards you know, intellectual property tribes requires to also reconsider the way those tribes are formed. Uh, we used to buy, you know, Italian designers because of the dream of, you know, this like Italian Dolce Vita and so on, or the Parisian designers because it has this like elegance and so on. All those concepts are completely vaporized in, in the metaverse. And so I think that, so I'm actually involved in a project related to architecture where we are trying to like reproduce uh, this, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, high end uh, street and, and things like that, because there is a... Um, uh, a space for that, or there is like uh, an area in the metaverse that that can be interesting to explore. Uh, but I think overall, the way culture is being designed, and this has started already with Tumblr um, back in the 2012-2013, where designers used to, used to shape their vision through some uh, physical uh, places like the fashion weeks and living in Paris, London, New York, and so on. And uh, with Tumblr, we have seen a level of coordination in terms of cultural production, where so many subcultures that didn't have a specific location started to emerge online, and that have led to things like hipsters and streetwear and like all those um, contemporary cultures. Same for YouTube. YouTube has inspired and has uh, produced a new, uh, a lot of new music genres that that combine all kinds of cultural cues together, like trap music coming from Atlanta and becoming this like global phenomena and so on. So I think that, um, yeah, the, the next 10 years, nothing much will change. There is still an hegemony for those industrial groups. I think that a bit beyond that, uh, everything is possible. And so it's great, I think, for them to be challenged and to um, see how they can transpose their um, yeah, their, their knowledge, and I think that right now it, it's a bit. Uh, the, the start will be a bit slow. Uh, Bucks, what what do you think are the uh, the corporate brands that are are best currently working in this space? Your your brands obviously working successfully in it, but what 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 works in the metaverse? Yeah, we, we talk to brands all the time and I'm telling you, everything is going to change. It's not going to take 10 years. It might not even take five. It's coming and it's coming incredibly fast just by the volume of stuff and, and the impact we've had. And, and people are realizing if you're a centralized business, you are going to be at a disadvantage soon. Our entire company is remote and we're global and we're here all of the time and we move incredibly fast. Um, you know, and we were able to give away through rewards and distributions over two billion US dollars last year alone. So when you've got propositions like that, brands start to sit up, take notice. How do we get involved and what are we what are we doing? And I think the key is and, and, and somebody mentioned it earlier, I think it was Dennis. They mentioned that phrase NFT, which, um, you know, you could do an entire hour on just on itself. But there's three things um, that I think if you're a brand playing in this space that you need to, to recognize and using this as an opportunity to make a quick piece of revenue is not gonna do you any favors and it will damage your brand irrecoverably if you're not careful. And I think we've all learned over the past decade, particularly with um, social becoming so prolific, is that you're not in control of your brand anymore. Your community are. Your brand is exactly what somebody else thinks it is. 
kids and yes. your job is to be a bit more of a shepherd and to, to try and make sure you're, you're you're being authentic and it becomes living and that they're part of that brand and I think that becomes really exciting because as we were talking about earlier things then become meshed together and, and people almost take on that as part of their identity too if you do it right but your, the brand, you know, an NFT has to mean something to you. It has to do something for you, for you, and it has to earn something for you. And so if I get something that I buy and I, you know, in the metaverse or I play with it in the metaverse and, and then the value isn't there in a month or two months time, I feel disappointed. I feel like it was a bit of a fad and I was ripped off. And that's where I think, you know, brands that embrace this play to earn, watch to earn, listen to earn, where to earn, whatever it is. And there's this it becomes more than a transactional relationship where a fan, a follower, an enthusiast can actually feel like they're part of that company. I think that becomes incredibly exciting. And that's when you get into wealth redistribution, that's when you get into borderless societies and it's a huge topic area. But the ones that are succeeding right now are the ones that are seeing it as more, of, um, more than a promotional campaign. And um, they're trying to figure out what's the value for my customer and actually, am I using blockchain in the right way? Am I doing something that has utility and gives some sort of ownership? Because to be honest, if they're coming in and they're doing something which with a nice little bit of UX and a QR code you could have achieved without blockchain, why on earth are you putting stuff on a blockchain and, and incurring gas and doing all that other kind of stuff? It, it doesn't make sense and the friction is huge. So um, brands that really sort of jump in and immerse and are true to the space and are happy to collaborate and share will be the ones that, that succeed. And, and we've done some stuff with the likes of Under Armour. We've worked with artists, um, you know, and they're the ones that they, they don't think they know it all yet because this is a, a brand new space and we're figuring it out. And that's the most single exciting thing about it. Gamers being passionate about making games again, marketers being passionate about new experiences they can create, brands figuring out that they're now they've got even more dimensions to play with. And it's the, it's the ones that want to explore and push the boundaries and not just recreate something on a different protocol that you're going to see change the world, quite frankly. And the others just, they're not going to exist. They will go. I agree. Uh, uh, Andrea, following on Bucks's comments, about experiences for a brand. You're, you're playing in this VR, AR kind of mixed reality space. Uh, uh, do you see uh, brands and uh, identities beginning to utilize this and migrate to it and maybe share some of your take on that? Yeah, we are seeing a lot of that. Actually, there's been an interesting turn in our direction lately. Um, I, I got into VR because the possibility of doing architecture without gravity was just so mesmer mesmerizing to me. And we are at the point where everyone wants some cool looking space. Uh, they want their brand in the metaverse and all of that. And um, we did a few. And then we stopped. Uh, we do not do that anymore. We actually only partner now with companies that are interested not just in the image part, but also in the utility part. A bit like real architecture. The reason why I went in, got into architecture was because it had the image part, the symbolism, it needs to like look wow, but then there's the utility part that it needs to have a function. Otherwise it's not architecture, it's sculpture. So I am personally a bit worried and getting fed up very, very fast of all the projects that I see out there where everyone is just chasing aesthetic gratification. It's like sh eating sugar and candy every single minute. Um, there are very few brands, almost none, to be honest, um, that are truly investing into finding the utility side of virtual architecture. So my proposition is that there is a utility side of virtual architecture is not just candy candy oh it looks amazing for five seconds and then you're bored um so for me the winners will be the ones that invest money and time and strategy into figuring out um what is beyond representation and image um what what is the utility in virtual world in real world we need architecture for shelter right like 
we're going to get rained on. Um, there are huge industries, the pharma industries, the food industry, and so on. So what's the equivalent of that in the metaverse? Because if the answer is, well, there isn't, um, and the answer is just the metaverse is where you go to be uh, aesthetically gratified, um, I'm already getting nauseous because of all the sugar I'm seeing. Um, so I'm hoping we will all figure out what else the metaverse is about. Well, uh, taking us down that alley, hopefully it has a, uh, an opening <laughs> at the other end. Uh, Carlos, you uh, want to add something to this issue of uh, brand identity? I know you, your company obviously looks at that space, works in it. Yes, we do have plenty. We, I would have plenty of things to say. I don't know many... <laughs> <laughs> How long we, we do you have to discuss about this. But uh, yeah, we, as I said at, big, at the beginning, in Wiseki, we have several verticals uh, and everything is uh, framed by the identity, uh, the, 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 the legacy is the digital identity be, beside of this. And we do have a, a solution for brand protection, uh, which are connected to digital identity. We do have a re, as well an NFT platform which is inheriting as well part of this technology. Because as I said at the beginning, the, for what is important for us is uh, uh, to have a, a, the assurance and the trust that the, not only the people to which, uh, which is transacting with our platform, but as well that the objects and the, the, the year, we, when we are talking about NFTs, uh, we, we might be talking about a lot of things, but let's say if we are talking about a, uh, an art piece, uh, these art piece must be genuine. And in order to assure that the genuinity of this piece, we have to issue an identity, a digital identity for this piece and digitally sign as well all the document of provenance, which are going to attest, testifying that this uh, art piece is a, a genuine. So yeah, we do have a, a plenty of, um, of solution uh, to address those those matters because more we are going into it was important as well in uh, already on the physical world, but uh, more we are going into the metaverse, uh, more this is going to be uh, needed because we are really uh, uh, talking in a, a virtual world and uh, we do not have our, do not have our, any more this visual interaction which might somehow try to legitimate that we have, uh, we do have in hands an object which is genuine when it is an NFT, as you can imagine. Yep. yep. Dennis, uh, do you want to add anything to the comments and what Carlos um, said? Yes, just briefly, maybe to uh, Bax and Andrea's point. Yes, there has to be utility behind whatever you're doing in the metaverse, not a matter of just maybe running after a shiny object. So maybe from the health aspect, uh, we've seen healthcare uh, companies are going into VR and some of them are starting to look at the metaverse because there's psychological benefits to especially pain management for patients because it's a way of escaping. So they are trying to use those technologies in terms of not only uh, as a brand um, kind of management, but also really having utility behind it whereby it's actually beneficial to, uh, to patients. The patients themselves. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, our hour is up. So what I'd like to do is just one last um, uh, take by everybody uh, on um, kind of the direction of this. If you're looking at uh, five years, um, uh, if you, <laughs> and if you want, you had an extra million dollars, where would you place your bet? <laughs> so uh, Bucks, go for it. Um, we're placing a billion dollar bet uh, on music, art, games, and film coming together in ways that will mean that people all over the world um, have a much better chance to participate and to live better lives. And so gaming has always created these wonderful worlds for people to escape into. And I think what's really exciting is now that games themselves, along with those other creative industries that have been squashed for years, um, are able to actually impact the real world we live in too. So I think as long as we get, uh, you know, carbon neutrality um, or even better, you know, carbon negativity in regards to the blockchain and some of the technologies that we're running, uh, I think we can have an incredible impact on the world. And I'm excited to see 
companies and worlds that we can't even imagine right now in five years time absolutely flourishing and meaning that we truly are global citizens and that we've got access to stuff that maybe the guys that you know we're sitting in Europe or the US that we we automatically have access to so that's yeah. what I'm I'm really excited about and I think it'll happen before five years too the speed of this industry is amazing every day in crypto is like a week <laughs> or maybe a month so um, I think it's it's coming fast and I'm really excited uh, no question Andrea mm -hmm. um, if I had a million bucks what would I do with it? An extra, my, an extra, an extra, yeah, <laughs> an extra. Um, well, it's all into things right now. But if I had an extra, my secret or not so secret desire is to have a research center where I hire anthropologists. Um, <laughs> I truly believe that this technology is changing what human beings are and do at such a deep level that we actually need anthropologists yeah okay i got it carlos besides anthropologists what do you think i would leave in vacation with one million dollars <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously uh seriously i i don't think that one million dollar would be enough to uh, really put in place what needs to be put in place uh for to assure the metaverse as it should be uh, assured but uh, i'm pretty much um I'm pretty sure that the companies actually are uh, really uh, concerned about this and they understand what have been the problems in the past related to identity and to the myths of identities. And this is now becoming part of the puzzle that everyone to, want to put in place as, a, uh, again, a framework to enter in the metaverse in a, with a certain assurance. All right. Sofian. With a million dollars, I think. I oh, would... just just an extra. It could be ten. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, one of the biggest challenges in the in the coming years will be around DAO governance. Uh, I think that this uh, this area of blockchain, uh, especially when it comes to to creativity, is very interesting. So I would do actually exactly what I'm doing right now, which is to to try and, and find ways for people to coordinate creatively in the sense that if we succeed at this, because the world is becoming increasingly creative, AI is going to replace a lot of the things that are currently held by the industrial world. Uh, the, the challenge is to make sure that we have a, a good way to coordinate around creative value. Uh, and, I, and I mean by that, you know, a political idea is, is, is a creative idea, you know, coming with a new proposal for the world. And so we better make sure that we are good at curating. Currently, a lot of the uh, creative economy is actually the attention economy repackaged in the sense that algorithms reward the kind of content that drives attention. And I think that recognizing the real creativity from, uh, you know, all the content that is trying to catch people's attention, I think is, a, is an interesting one. And in general, uh, being able to to allocate the attention and the funds on the ideas and the concepts that are uh, valuable, I think is going to be uh, to be the, the main topic, and it's my my obsession uh, yeah. currently. Excellent, Dennis. Any uh, final thoughts on this issue? Uh, my blank check will be identity, security, and also ownership of data. Um, I believe those three, if they can be resolved, I see them um, as a unified, think of it as a holy trinity, those three. So, and they are the gateway to all these things we're trying to get into, especially in the new digital world. So if we can, uh, if I can change something, that is uh, the thing I'll work on uh, on our end. Excellent. You know, uh, it's obviously impossible to summarize uh, what you guys, um, went through today, the, uh, when you put a group of creative people together like you, uh, the, it, it, you open up uh, more new worlds than obviously you answer. And that's the whole point of creativity. You, you've uh, broadened perspectives and, and given me uh, 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 actually uh, several new uh, trains of thought. Coming off the sugar high, 
I think is important uh, for this, this whole um, endeavor. Uh, because the real value, uh, I spent my life in innovative, um, uh, you know, kind of sectors and uh, creativity is what drives uh, the human spirit. And you guys certainly have typified that you're spending your lives doing it. And it was a pleasure to spend the panel with you today. And hopefully our audience enjoys it. And uh, let's all continue this in the future. We'll find a way to uh, do another one together. So great pleasure uh, being with you all today and uh, have a great evening. Take Thank care. Thank you guys. Take care of yourselves. Take care. Bye. You too. Take care. Thank you. Great to meet you guys.